please welcome to the stage Craig McClucky, until recently product manager for Kubernetes at Google and now leading yet another Kubernetes related startup. Hey folks, uh, so that last question was like a brilliant segue to what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about cloud native operations, right? So I was asked to uh, come here and talk to you about what I was geeking on next, like, you know, what I was thinking about. It's always a dangerous uh, request because you likely hear me geek on config and not everyone loves config as much as I do. Um, but for today, I'd like to kind of spend some time uh, talking about the impact of these technologies on your operations story uh, and the value proposition of container technologies, not just as a way to package up and deploy your applications, but as a way to live with them, as a way to actually create more agile organizations, as a way to move forwards into a much more progressive way to build technologies and run them. So I'm going to go through a kind of flow of conscious uh, sort of you know, perspective on what I'm calling cloud native operations or cluster operations and uh, how it's likely to apply to enterprise, uh, how it will change your perspective on uh, running uh, these, these systems in production, and uh, how it's actually just going to accelerate your organization spectacularly. Um, so just bear with me a little bit. And uh, because I'm talking about the future, I figured I'd, I'd just use like random science fiction quotes to illustrate a point. Um, and this one's a little bit meta, but whatever. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's set the scene, right? This is where we are today. Um, and it's a very interesting time for software companies. We're at a time when you have companies like Ford trying to figure out how to become a software company. At the same time, Tesla, which is effectively a software company, is trying to figure out how to become an automobile company. Uh, the world's increasingly competitive, and software is probably the most powerful business tool out there today. Uh, it's becoming an uh, absolutely critical differentiator for almost every enterprise out there. How effectively, how well you can engage with technologies to solve business problems is huge. And anything that creates friction in that path to getting your production systems out there, to actually being able to evolve your production systems to match the evolving needs of your customers, the evolving needs of your business, is going to slow you down, right? So the next point of observation is that you know, software is eating the world. Anderson said that, and I think it's been quoted like a gazillion times, not a gazillion one times. Um, but open source is eating the software world. You know, we look at uh, the way that businesses want to engage and operate. They become much more invested in controlling their own destiny. I speak to a lot of very big banks or very big insurance companies or very big healthcare you know, companies. And they're invested in not just you know, you know, breaking the deadlock of a lot of these uh, sort of more traditional enterprise uh, sort of vendors, they're also highly invested in actually engaging and controlling their own destiny, styling themselves as software companies, participating in developing the software that runs their business, making sure that it actually achieves the outcomes that they're looking for. Uh, and inside the lens of that, cloud is happening. And when I say cloud is happening, everyone looks at it as like, okay, you've solved the infrastructure operations problems. That's really neat. I can go get a virtual machine. I can run whatever I want. It's this move away from the world where I used to have to think about uh, buying you know, infrastructure and racking and stacking and dealing with it and, and dealing with the depreciation of that. I now have a much more agile way to buy the infrastructure that I run. That's not what I mean. Cloud is about service, right? And my own personal journey here is I, I came from Microsoft. I spent 12 years in the big house, uh, hard time, by the way, um, building enterprise, <laughs> enterprise software, right? And uh, I got dropped into a team at Google. And these are the kind of crazy cloud guys, right? And they, like, we just didn't, I, I, I don't know who was more shocked. Whether I was more shocked arriving in this incredibly dynamic environment where people just had this bias to action, the ability to get technology out there. If a customer didn't like it, you can roll it back. If you want to find out whether customers like it, you can deploy it to 1% of your folks, right? It's a fundamentally and profoundly different way to think about building technology and delivering it, right? And here I was, the old enterprise guy, like, no, we need to get it just right, and we'll spend three years, and we'll throw it over the wall, and then we'll figure out whether customers like it or not, right? Um, it was shocking. And as I look at the cloud companies that are succeeding, they're, they're companies either like Amazon, they just got there way before everybody else and had time to figure it out. Um, it's companies like Microsoft who actually bought their way into the space with Bing and uh, you know, with um, the Xbox Live assets that they built. Like, it taught them how to deliver service. It taught them how to think about technology as a service. And I actually think if, if Microsoft hadn't done that, they would have really struggled. I look at companies like Google, where this is just directly in the DNA. There's just no question about them thinking about this way. And when we think about this transition to cloud, it's about adopting this model, which is thinking about your technology more as a service. It's a living thing. It's an agile thing. It's something you can update and tune as you go. 
And this presentation is about how you operate it. It's not about how you build it. Uh, the building is a component of it. It's about how you actually live with it. So let's look at the sort of history of operations. First of all, there was the kind of the dark ages of operations where the developers had direct access to the machines. Weird things happened. And uh, the response to that was um, to sort of create this, this canon around system administrators. These are professional, serious people that are responsible for owning and managing and configuring your production systems. So it creates this natural tension. You have the developers that want to go fast, they want to get stuff out there. You have the system administrators like, whoa, not so fast. Let's get it right, right? And uh, the basic atom of work in this world of system administrators is the ticket. So hey, I want to get a production change out there, file a ticket. You know, I want to get a new server, file a ticket. Um, I want to uh, you know, update some kind of setting, I file a ticket. And then an operator takes that ticket, and somewhere between you know, you know, a few hours a day, a week, or three months in, in some cases, the, the final outcome happens, right? And uh, it worked. It actually it, it, it sort of reigned in the dark ages of developer-driven uh, deployment, and it created a uh, system whereby you could consistently, reliably get things onto production, but slowly. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, it just doesn't scale that well. Like, as you scale your infrastructure linearly, you need to scale the set of operators relatively linearly. So uh, the next change was this idea that um, the heroic developer can do pretty much anything. You know, code is an amazing tool. And uh, if you read this quote, it's, like a, it's a Robert Heinlein quote. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, right? This idea that you want to create these perfectly well-rounded uh, heroes that can go in there they can code the heck out of a problem in Java or whatever the development language is, and then they can code the heck out of how to get that into the production environment using one of these DevOps tools. And uh, it actually is, is pretty neat in some ways because you've kind of systematized the process of getting something onto production. You can create a recipe, it becomes repeatable, there's much less toil, it's a lot easier to actually get things out there. And you become, you get to this point where your sort of atom of work, the atom of operation is this integration. So I can some code, I can run some tests, I can get some CI CD stuff running, I can get my uh, workload into production. And uh, it's great. Uh, it works really well, except when it doesn't. And when it doesn't, things get really weird, right? Because what you're effectively doing is running a lot of imperative code in a production environment. A scaling event happens, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up a piece of infrastructure and I'm going to like, get something running, and then I'm going to step into that and then run a bunch of imperative code to get it configured just right. And if something goes wrong, uh, heaven help me. So um, it's, a neat, it's, a neat, it's a neat framework, and it's seen a lot of success, but it is a sharp tool, and it's requiring your developers to be these extremely well-rounded generalists. So there's a third way of running um, operations teams that um, I've seen uh, a lot of at Google. And this is kind of this, uh, what I call a cloud native operations model. Uh, and it's a little different to the world of system administration. It's a little different to the world of DevOps. In this world, uh, you have a set of professional teams that are responsible for delivering common services at the application level to your developers. And the basic point of integration becomes an API. So if I want a new cluster, I call an API. If I want a new service, I call a provisioning API. At the back end of that, there's a professional set of teams that are automating uh, like crazy to make sure that when that API gets called, I actually get a, provisioned, uh, a properly provisioned system. I mean, this model is always possible. It's become extremely relevant as clustering technologies like Kubernetes or Mesos um, um, or Cloud Foundry are starting to emerge, right? It creates a much more programmatic framework where people can start specializing and delivering these operational uh, frameworks. So um, it's awesome. Of course, it is uh, relatively new. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means. So let's dive into uh, you know, some of the attributes of this. You know, like what, what are the ingredients you need to assemble to get a cloud native operations environment uh, working? Well, it starts with having this idea of logical infrastructure. So this is kind of this cluster environment. And we, we, you heard a lot about this earlier with, with technologies like Kubernetes. The idea is that instead of uh, deploying your application and reasoning about your application being tied to a piece of physical infrastructure, you're handing your application off to an autonomous subsystem that will figure out how to map it into the infrastructure in an optimal way. Uh, it has some nice advantages, because by using it, it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly efficient, but it also removes toil. So the role, which was previously consumed by a human operator who's having to 
tediously go through the steps of configuring this, the system, or by a piece of random code that someone wrote that kind of you know ran through and you know like did this you know in a sort of bespoke crafted way, you now have an autonomous system doing this. And it turns out there's some things that machines do better than people. And one of those things is deploying software. There's a lot of other things machines do better than people. Um, but you know, this is just a prime example of this. And so if you look at the way that Google runs, um, all of the infrastructure is logical infrastructure. You don't think about a physical machine. You think about a job or a task or a deployment. Um, the next sort of observation uh, and sort of attribute of this is you have to be relentlessly focused on automation. You have to be the laziest you know, person from a, from a toil perspective and you have to love automation and automating um, pieces. So this works if you have this constant and relentless focus on reducing toil from your operations environment. If anything can be done in an autonomous system, have an autonomous system do that. Spend the time to get it right, you know, create a specialized you know, function that's, that's actually delivering professional services around this uh, and, and good things happen. Um, the other attribute here um, that is really important is this idea that you create specialized roles. Today, DevOps assumes that your developer is a relatively generic person that can do all of the things that Highline said, right? Uh, in this world, your developer is able to focus largely on solving business problems. And you have other people that have operations uh, expertise that deliver a set of common services to the developer. So you may have a team that deals with infrastructure operations. They will rack and stack and get you to a point where you have a cluster environment anywhere. It could be on your on-prem uh, environment, it could be on Amazon, Microsoft, Google, you know, wherever. But long story short, uh, it's one team that gets you to the cluster environment. The next team has a common cluster environment to start from, and they get you to a point where you have a set of common services. So instead of each engineering team having to worry about how to configure and install Cassandra and you know, you know, try to find some template on the web and, and deploy that into their own little environment, you have professionals that, that spend their life doing this, and they get really good at it. So you get the specialization. Um, the next sort of piece of this is that uh, you have these kind of shared services, which I've already talked about, um, where you can, you know, as a developer, declaratively describe the set of pieces you want. You don't have to package them up with your application. You don't have to reuse them as part of your application. They just show up in your environment uh, and are prepared for you by an expert. Um, and then the final piece of it is, is this, autonomy, this is autonomy, auto automation. Having expert systems that will get your environment configured just right that can observe the state and the health of your system, make informed decisions. So when that paging event happens that we were talking about, 95% uh, of the time, the system's just gonna recover it for you and deal with it. And you're only gonna have to deal with situations where it's, it's literally kind of you know, broadly out of bounds of, of what these, uh, these systems can do. So Kubernetes with its, uh, with its control metaphors, a lot of the patterns that have been, been introduced there provide you a very powerful framework to avoid having to deal with you know, the sort of operations uh, toil and, 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 and dealing with things like optimization. So as a result of that, we start to see these new roles emerge. Um, and these become specialized roles. So in the old days, you had a system administrator and a developer. You know, then you had just developers or DevOps. or what, I don't even know what a DevOps is exactly. But you know, a, a poor developer that has to actually deal with both the operations and the development component. Now what you start to see happening is, uh, is these new roles emerge. And these don't have to be different people. These could be just you know, small teams. It still applies. You just wear different hats at different times. But it's really important to focus on the emergence of these roles. Someone deals with the infrastructure. Someone deals with the cluster. Someone deals with common services. Uh, someone deals with application operations. It could be the person who built the application. Or if the application is big enough, you may actually stand up a discrete um, application operations team. And then you have, at the end of the day, the developer who is empowered, they're generalist, and they don't need to worry about everything else. They become much more efficient by nature. And so as a result of this, the specialization, you know, one of the things that happens when you specialize is you get really good at something. Right? Like you, you, you become a specialist, you become an expert. It lets you take your game to the next level. And one of the things that cloud native uh, technologies do by creating the separation of operations roles is it lets operators uh, take their game to a new level. So if you look at the SRE um, folks at Google, I don't know, has anyone here read the Google SRE um, book that just came out? Um, <laughs> there you go. Right? Uh, if you haven't read it, you should. It's, uh, it's a really interesting book. It, it, it captures a lot of tribal knowledge uh, from Google. Um, and it gives you a little peek into the mindset of the professional operator, the person who's responsible and passionate not just about you know, building something, but of actually running it as a service, 
to an organization, you know, to an IT team, you know, to a set of customers. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very distinct. Um, and you know, again, I keep coming back to this. The SREs are both the geekiest and laziest people you'll ever meet. They will automate the heck out of everything. If they ever find a task that's not automated, they regard that as toil and it's an insult to them, and they would rather have an autonomous system deal with that. And so they, they, they focus on creating a set of APIs that remove them personally from the flow of operations so they can go back to drinking or whatever it is the SREs do when they're not actively dealing with issues. Um, and the other thing that's, that's kind of interesting when you start interacting with these teams, when you start spending time with the SRE teams, is like, you know, it turns out actually they're not all that lazy. Like they, they do some stuff which is kind of neat. Like they take, they take service level monitoring to a new level. You'll find a lot of people out there who'll be like, look, I monitor errors, right? The SREs don't do that. I mean, they'll obviously monitor errors, but they'll also monitor traffic. They'll monitor latencies. They'll observe all these things at you know, the, you know, the, the, the median and then at the 99th percentile and the 99.9th percentile. And they use that, and they'll, they'll monitor things like saturation, like how much resource is actually being used. And they'll start to create these observations around you know, how does saturation impact error rates? How does saturation impact latency? And they get to a point of maturity in terms of how they're thinking about the services that they're managing. It lets them become much more nuanced around capacity planning. It lets them become much more nuanced around understanding what happens when, when things go wrong. The other thing is that they delight in, uh, in planning. So um, a lot of these specialized operations team can actually take the time to do things like generate uh, an incidence response playbook. Um, they can start to do uh, d disaster uh, testing scenarios. If your job, your sole job, is to deliver a Cassandra cluster to an organization, and you don't have to worry about 99 other technologies, and you're doing that, you know, and you're, you're managing these clusters over and over and over again, uh, there's a chance that you will have time to actually think about what happens when a ring goes down, uh, that you'll actually be able to create a systemized, systematized playbook, and that you will have a better shot at getting it back up uh, than an individual development team who's only been dabbling in this technology and has, has found a template online and got it running in their, in their environment. Um, they also get really fancy with the way that they tend to manage uh, their applications. Um, so uh, Matt and, and uh, Chris were talking a little earlier about uh, some of these more nuanced uh, deployment uh, approaches, where how to think about uh, taking a technology and doing you know, blue-green deployments, or how do I actually run an experiment. And so these teams create these operational frameworks using the logical infrastructure that lets you do more interesting things. And as a result, uh, you get much more practical ways to actually deploy a technology. You can imagine a centralized team uh, that's running a mission-critical data service deciding to do a company-wide update and bringing down the entire organization. That would be horrible. It would be a horrible outcome. So the nice thing about these teams is that they start to be able to say, well, you know what? Like, you know, we understand the application portfolio. There's some stuff that no one cares about. Let's, uh, let's get two of these services running in production, and we'll slowly vector load across those, that other service. Technologies like Kubernetes let you do that. They let you actually create these sort of operational models where you can be much more nuanced about how you, you get technology out there. Um, and they let you test things. You, know, you can vector a, a small portion of your load to a new framework and see if your users like it, see if it changes some of those core metrics. You have the data, you're able to run it better, um, and operations gets you to this, this, this new level. So it's not enough to just uh, say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. Uh, we're, gonna get, we're gonna be all in cloud natives. Here we go. Uh, we're gonna stand up our operations team. Like, turns out you probably need to think a little bit about the applications as well and uh, invest some time in creating the right, uh, the right architecture that actually supports this new operational um, paradigm. And one of the things that I'm most excited about when I think about designing agile systems and you know, you know, creating uh, systems that are much more operationally viable is this idea of uh, almost a, a continuous spectrum of decomposition, where you walk into an environment, and I've seen this a lot recently, where you know, an, an organization will have a monolithic application, big old monolithic application. And the first thing they'll start to do is they'll start to look at it and say, hey, you know, I want to deploy this into a container environment. Could I jam it into a single container? Well, probably. Like, is it a good idea? I don't know, maybe not. Uh, the first port of decomposition is to start extracting some of those pieces uh, into separate containers that are not intrinsically deeply coupled. So if you look at the way that Google would, for instance, deploy a front-end serving component that might have a, a serving, an HTTP serving component, it might have a log roller and a data shard updater. 
uh, the first thing will be those things will be put into different containers, right? So they're not intrinsically decoupled. They're still deployed together. They're still tied together. They still have access to shared resources. Um, but if I need to update one of them, I can do that without disrupting the rest of it. If one of them goes crazy, I can set reasonable bounds so it doesn't disrupt the behavior of the other components, right? So the first step on route to better operations is decomposition and not treating a container like a VM. A container's not like a VM. A container's actually much more awesome than a VM. Uh, containers let you piece things together in more natural fashions. And, uh, and then when you, you layer that on top, uh, the next thing is to say, okay, you know, like I have this monolith and it's, it's relatively tied together. Uh, I've pulled out the, the common pieces and, and I've put them in, in containers. Can I now start putting some of those things behind stable interfaces? You know, can I start identifying subsystems that I can put behind a stable interface and run as a discrete service? So, you know, like, so it's like, a, yeah, this monolith, it, it looks like people taking chunks out of it, right? And it's actually amazing how quickly an IT team as de dedicated can turn a monolithic application that's relatively tightly coupled into a reasonably well-facted uh, cloud-native application by focusing on the functional areas, by chewing them off, by putting a stable interface behind them, and then dropping it into something like Kubernetes. The application continues to, to operate just as you'd expect, but now you have a way to reason about the pieces. Now you have a way to evolve the pieces and operate the pieces without having to, to focus on it. The next step is then to start looking at, across these applications, which of the set of things do I want to reuse? You know, can I take that, that, that component that's now a service, can I create a standard template, a standard deployment framework, and then provide it to other people so they can stamp out their own versions, right? So now you have a microservices reusability or, or sort of, you know, um, reuse framework. And you can start to put an operations team managing each of these discrete pieces. And then the final step is to actually promote those pieces to a, like, an heroic service where there's an API that's used to provision them uh, and they um, are operated by professionals. There's a common standard interface and uh, it becomes a standard asset for all of your developers. So you can see a path um, as a, a sort of empowered enterprise to go from these relatively monolithic, difficult to deal with, difficult to operate systems to over time just like start loosening up the pieces, decompose it, get it into a more structured form where you actually have an intelligent subsystem that's gonna operate it for you. Uh, define the health models for those pieces, create those stable interfaces, and you're off to the races. You're now in a position where you can start to treat it like a more progressive system and create the specialized operations around it. And, uh, and every point of aggregation you create, every time you aggregate and you create a shared component, and reduce the number of different configurations that are deployed, you have an organizational opportunity to specialize. You have a chance to actually create a team that is expert at dealing with that thing. And it means that other teams don't have to. And so that's, that, 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 that pursuit of specialization is, is one of the key attributes here. And then one of the final things I want to talk about is, um, is not just the operational model, not just the architecture, but the organizational structure that emerges around this, right? I don't know if people have heard about Conway's Law. I, I bet you, if you haven't heard about it before, you're gonna hear about it a lot in the next like, couple of years, right? Now, Conway speculated that um, system architectures follow the lines of communications of the teams that design them, right? So if you have a big old monolithic uh, user experience team, that is you know, communicating through a single point of contact with some of the other teams, you'll tend to create a, a monolithic uh, you know, front-end component. Um, and he, you know, he, he observed this, this over time. And uh, one of the really neat things about this, this approach, this philosophy of, of cloud-native uh, systems, decomposition, specialized operations, is that your teams can get a lot smaller. You no longer have to staff each team with an expert on every subsystem you want to use that you're necessarily you know, building and, and operating. You no longer have to staff your team with uh, the sort of DevOps uh, capabilities. You can create much smaller teams that have access to these robust services. They don't have to operate them. They don't have to deal with them. They can just consume them. And as a result, they become smaller. They get much closer to the business. They become uh, much more nimble. And you have created a strong value multiplier for your organization. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, this leads to a lot of good things. Um, it gets you to a point where you're operating more efficiently. Uh, specialization is powerful. Um, having people that are really good at operations makes your systems run far, far more efficiently. Um, and uh, you get better use out of the infrastructure. So there's, there's just a lot of, of really neat things here. Um, of course, uh, you know, one of the, you know, it's, it's early days. We've got a lot of work to do as a group, as a team, as a community um, to, to get to this point. 
Um, we have some really strong foundational technologies. We've made a lot of the down payments we need to get there. Um, but it's not enough to just you know, dream this. We need to, to, we need to really get together and get better tooling. Like we need to get better tooling that provides uh, specialized operations capabilities at the cluster level, at the application level. Uh, we need to deliver better playbooks of like how to actually even approach this and start to you know, reason about the functional decomposition of, uh, of, of monolithic applications, how to uh, deal with cluster operations, how to deal with incidents. There's, there's just a lot of work to be done uh, to imagine this. And I'm really excited to uh, you know, look to the next couple years um, as a community and see where this all goes. So I will pause there. I think that's 26 minutes and uh, see if there's any questions. Any questions for him besides what's the name of his new stealth startup? <laughs> if not, we'll say, oops. So, uh, a couple, so a couple examples, um, debugging. So you know, one of the things that happens today is uh, an application goes sideways. Um, and uh, you can generate SSH and access the local logs and try to figure out what's happening. If necessary, you can get into the, you know, you can get into whatever debugging, so to speak, you want. Um, in the world of, of cluster-based operations, um, you know, first of all, the application you know, may have been torn down because it went into a bad state. Um, it may have been rescheduled somewhere else. Um, you, know, you don't necessarily want your developer to have access to the physical machines where it's running. And so providing you know, better uh, diagnostics and uh, analytics uh, tools that let the developers actually understand what went wrong without having to physically access the machine is, is necessary. That's one you know, tiny, small example. There's, there's a lot of others around things like, hey, I want to you know, run a, a cluster uh, in, a, in an organization. How do I do things like departmental chargeback? You know, if, if it's becoming a common service, how do people you know, think about that? Um, and, uh, and then you know, for, the, for the common services, you know, like I know that like, the, the desk guys are doing some really awesome work around templating. We still have a long way to go whereby we can actually create clean, reusable, deployable components uh, you know, to stand up services. So um, I think the foundations are there. I think there's a whole ecosystem of, of capabilities that need to emerge. Yeah, so I think, I think there's a couple of uh, things. Um, let's just break them in a couple of groups. There's uh, a set of what I call distributed system services. So a lot of people want to run something that is, uh, for instance, run in a master elected pattern. Um, you know, standing up Raft or Paxos is really difficult. So you know, initially, you at least need some cluster services that let you, you know, say, hey, this is the master, this is the slave, et cetera. So there's a lot of basic distributed system services that, that need to exist. And that could be storage, it could be you know, quoruming, it could be naming, discovery, et cetera. The next layer up is what I call you know, common application services. So this could be things like, you know, hey, Cassandra or Mongo or you know, whatever your storage asset is. Uh, this could be um, an indexing uh, framework. Or you know, there's, there's just a lot of open, you know, free open source you know, packages that could be built and deployed as common services so that when a developer says, hey, I'm deploying a th you know, three-tier application, this is the storage asset I want, I want to get MySQL running, there's a team that can actually provision it and run it. The cloud provider could do it for you, but on-prem, it would be nice to have that same basic experience and actually have a service that's, that's semantically equivalent to whatever the one you're using in the cloud is. Then the next thing you get to is where you start to create domain-specific services that are useful for your organization. You're a shipping company, you might want to do lat long to you know, zip code lookup. You know, having, you know, deploying you know, 480 libraries that you know, contain that information and, you know, everywhere just doesn't make sense. Having one team that actually just does the zip code lookup service behind an endpoint makes a ton more sense. So you can start to create these domain specific services that are relevant to you. And you know, obviously every, every, every company and every domain is gonna have a different set of services. So that's a great question. It's like, how do you actually deal with the inherent uh, tension between uh, change and you know, uh, and, and not changing these things? Um, so, you know, there's probably a dark organizational science to to dealing with uh, you know change and innovation. Um, the the first thing that you know I think is essential to any of these situations is uh, you know you have to get to a point where you have stable interfaces. Um, you know, to, to be able to change anything on either side of the divide, um, you need to be able to you know, create stable interfaces. The second thing you need to encourage people to do is make sure you have the capability to run multiple versions of anything ever, like in, in production. Um, and as a result, if you have a stable interface and the ability to run versions, you create this natural tension where 
um, the target organization can always stand up their own rendition of what you're doing. Uh, they can fork, kind of like the open source community. There's always that possibility of forking, right? So if they need to, um, because what you're using is templatized, it has a strong structured basis, there's that tension which is an organization that needs to move fast and has a legitimate business need can always stand up one of their own. Um, and that creates a natural dynamic tension um, in these organizations. So, um, you know, and, and how that plays out, uh, that there's an organizational science to that. But I would say that the, the key thing is, is reproducibility, stable interfaces, make sure that everything you deploy is, is templatized, have the ability to run multiple versions of anything. Um, and then uh, that gives you a, a, a good framework to create the right dynamic tension between the service provider and the service consumer. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, there's, there's some interesting stuff that, that just cannot be delegated out. So governance, risk management, compliance, security posture, et cetera. One of the lovely things about these technologies, clustering containers, is that your level of introspectability and determinism becomes very high. You can define policy and enforce policy autonomously through your stack. If everything, every deployment is being driven through a structured API, uh, you can apply policy at that API event. If everything is declarative, your configuration, the bits you're running, et cetera, uh, you can define policy and make sure that it's enforced at the runtime level. So you actually have a much more robust set of tools to define and control policy. But one of the things that to, you know, the, the earlier question around what needs to be built, the set of tools to actually de define and enforce you know, policy and provide introspectability at the cluster level or across multiple clusters is essential for this, uh, this to work. <coughs> 